you by Ford. Built Ford Proud. Our goal is freedom. I believe we will win it right here in Atlanta. Atlanta must not fool herself any longer. We must be willing to suffer when necessary, go to jail when necessary, and even risk our lives to become witnesses to the truth as we see it. My father loved the city of Atlanta, of course, because this is where he was born. He grew up here, he was educated here. He wanted to make sure that he lived in the community where the people were. He was a product of the Atlanta streets. A lot of memories on the West Hunter Street. Pascal's Motor Hotel, a very historic gathering place for members of the Civil Rights Movement. Most of the meetings of the Civil Rights Movement were held uh, in its ballroom. The center of Hunter Street was the Atlanta University Complex. Atlanta University Center was the uh, intellectual center of black America. 1966, it was along Hunter Street, King led one of his last protests in his home city of Atlanta, demanding that Julian Bond be seated in the Georgia State Legislature. To that point, he had been denied access to his rightful seat. He was dismissed because he opposed the war in Vietnam. We are going to see that day right here in Atlanta, Georgia, when Julian Bond will be back in that state legislature. <laughs> Sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. In the wake of King's assassination, uh, Atlanta and particularly Hunter Street became a central gathering place for the world, watching the funeral procession. I, I didn't know what to expect. I was trying to get my friend and brother comfortably in the ground. We expected it to be a crowd, but we didn't expect all of America to show up. <laughs> There's a whole lot of people gathered on that day. The street was literally solid people, as far as you could see, uh, to downtown Atlanta. Later, uh, I was surprised that they really underplayed the number of people that were there. When you watch the news reports, it usually referred to tens of thousands. And I'm sure there were several hundred thousand because you couldn't fill that much space solid without having that many. The first city that we know of that named a street for Dr. King was Chicago, just months after King's assassination in 1968. And when you think about Atlanta and you consider the fact that it took uh, at least eight years, one wonders why it did take so long. I was a little embarrassed that it took us as long as we did. White Fowler was on the Atlanta City Council during much of the debate over naming a street for Dr. King. I thought it was a wonderful idea and, and, and high time that we honored our own. Martin Luther King Street in Atlanta was formed from three older existing streets. The initial proposal and the activism behind it uh, was directed by Mr. Morris Finley, a city councilman at the time. On this side of the community, we got generals that's being honored. Gordon Drive, named after John B. Gordon, a Confederate general. On that side of the community, we got generals being honored. Mosley Drive was named for Hiram Mosley, a uh, Confederate doctor turned businessman, and Hunter Street, named for Alston Hunter Green, a prominent planter and slave owner. I want to honor black folks. And I sit down and I start looking at all the people who were my heroes and she wrote. The leader was Dr. King. Even though some people may think that naming a street is a pretty easy task or a relatively simple matter, street naming was an act of activism. It was an act of uh, going out and generating public support and dealing with public opposition. And in fact, Mr. Finley exactly found that. He actually tried to get multiple streets named for Dr. King and ran into opposition and struggle. What I wanted to do is build the entire box that we was in. I ran into problems. There was a, a general anxiety within the city of Atlanta. Personal and political rivalries going on uh, within and between the white and black communities within Atlanta about exactly how much they wanted to identify with King 
and exactly where best to remember him within the city. I'm sure there were some that did not want to have their businesses on a street named after a prominent black man. I chose a street I feel would be no opposition. Connor Street. Here we go again with another one of the generals. Martin's movement was, from the very beginning, to redeem the soul of America from the triple evils of racism, war, and poverty. Old Hunter Street, going right straight through the black community, was a pathway through poverty. It may seem strange to me to say this, but I, I don't think it, that it was uh, primarily uh, a racial matter. My greatest opposition were black folks. The people who live and work and have their businesses on streets don't like change. Everybody wants to protect their own. So now I go to explain, hey, do you know this guy right here killed all these people who fought in the Civil War? Didn't make no difference. That means you got to change my stationery. They don't like to have to tell everybody that they have a new address. If you really want something, you do you know how to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. When the street was named, I thought it was very significant that it was a street that went into the downtown community. Years of, during my father's life, he could not go into that downtown area. Once it happened, it's impossible not to have a, a little ego trip whenever you go under that sign. <laughs> it was speaking about a, a new way of looking at Atlanta's history. I, too, had a dream. And I got mine in black and white. This is a man who, when he was assassinated, he was one of the most hated men in America. Now, he's one of the most loved men in the world. And that's evident by so many things. The streets that are named after him, it just happens to be one of those many ways. I take the naming of the streets of the nation after Martin Luther King as a promise. If we think putting up a sign on the street is paying tribute to this man who gave his life for this nation, the street's not worth a damn. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive is depressed. What we invested in as older people did not turn around and reinvest in us. And so you see neglected streets. The streets in almost every city go through poor neighborhoods. When a lot of cities did begin to name their streets for Martin Luther King, I think it was Chris Rock. His routine was, if somebody calls you and says, I'm lost, I'm on Martin Luther King, run! Run! It ain't the safest place to be. Dr. King didn't dream of a city that was in disrepair. So what we have envisioned in Atlanta is an ML King drive that is befitting of Dr. King's legacy. We really need the people that we invested in to come back and invest in us and our neighborhood. It should be a source of pride for everybody. It's a reminder that we still have a lot of work to do. We need to invest a lot in transforming these communities so that they truly live up to the icon. If we take it as a promise that we should turn Martin Luther King's streets throughout our nation into avenues of hope and promise for the least of these God's children, whatever color they may be. Nothing could make Martin Luther King more proud. It's about repairing a community or repairing inequality. There is no other street like it. We're all excited to see what he does, and we've heard mm -hmm. from his peer group. We've heard from lots of people as it relates to Zion Williamson. Now let's hear from Zion himself. This is from earlier today after practice. It's been great, man. The city's beautiful. Um, the people are beautiful as well. They, um, they welcome me. I feel like they adopted me a bit. Um, they show love everywhere I go, and they just tell me that they can't wait for me to get back out there. Now, thinking back to your first game at Duke, how does this kind of compare to that? Uh... I don't know. I think it might be a little different magnitude of this one. Um, <laughs> this is my first NBA game. Um, this is business now. It's different. Do you think there'll be 
a learning curve of some kind? How do you expect teammates to adjust to you, you to adjust to them? Um, I think there will be a learning curve, but I don't think it'll be nothing dramatic. I think it'll be something where, you know, I think we're pros. I think we'll just adapt maybe after a game or two. How good do you think you can be right off the bat? Um, man, do I even get to determine that, to be honest? Uh, <laughs> my plan, to be honest, is to go out there and just contribute where coach needs me. Diane, what, what specific ways do you think your, your body is better now prepared to handle the stress? Um, uh, flexibility, you know, a lot of, I've been working on my landing a lot. I think those two things will help me a lot. Mentally, I'm sure this has been really exhausting and trying, especially because you're having to wait so long to play your first NBA game. What has kind of the, the voice been to you from people in the front office and on the team? Um, uh, they're, they're, they're with me. Um, they do all the hard stuff. They're going to be with me. And you know, I think my mom as well, you know, she always looks at me and go. You know, nobody told you this was going to be easy, so it's a part of the journey. I embrace it, and I get to play. When you say working on your landing, what does that mean? How how do you, I guess, land now? What what's it change? <laughs> uh, I think it's just not landing straight legs. Just kind of let my don't let all my force just go into my legs. Um, it's a lot of technical stuff. I really couldn't explain it to you, to be honest. I could probably show you on video better. But I did learn a lot about my body in this um, time period, and I. Came a lot from watching film and where to use my energy and, you know, try to make smarter reads and not exhaust so much energy. How much pressure are you putting on yourself? I mean, obviously you dreamed of this day your whole life going back to being a little kid, so is there any pressure you're putting on yourself just to live up to everything you imagined it would be? Um, I'm not really putting no pressure on it at all. Um, I love to play basketball, so I'm just looking to go out there, have fun, and compete. Don, did all your friends and family ask for tickets for the game? And are you proud of them? I mean, I would hope so. They are my friends and family. Uh, <laughs> I think the rehab workouts, um, they're long and strenuous. Um, you know, it's a lot of, it was a lot of times when I just wanted to you know, punch a wall or kick chairs because it's frustrating um, to not be able to move your body the way you want to, not to make any athletic movements. Um, I mean, it's tough, especially since I'm 19 and I haven't even played my first NBA game. So it was, it was tough, but... I battle through it. Is there, is there any part of you from being able to watch from the sideline and stuff that you can apply even on your first night? Um, I think it was just attention to detail on defense. Um, now you can always look at a scouting report, but I think it's just a matter of the feel of the game and the cool your garden. I think is there a part of this process where now that you're able to kind of look back a little bit, you feel like catching an injury like this at the time, as far as the longevity of your career is concerned, it could, could be a blessing in disguise at all? Uh, that's exactly what my mom said. Um, she just said it was you know, time to focus on my body, you know, focus on any small mechanics that need to be fixed. Do you think all this work that you've done will help you avoid any kind of chronic knee problems? Are you concerned about that at all? Or you feel confident that this has helped you kind of alleviate that before it might even happen? Um, I think it does help with, you know, future injuries. Um, I mean, something I got to continue to, you know, have a less chance of getting hurt. Um, you know, we've talked with the training staff about it. It's just consistency and sticking with the program. A lot to unpack there. Yeah, and I have so many questions to ask you. Is it well, really far away, man. It's just us. I know, right? Um, let's talk about injuries. He said that it's frustrating sitting out for so long. Mm. And I know that you had... A pretty serious injury that kept you out for a while. What was that like? Yeah, I, I had an injury when I was in D.C. I had a wrist injury kept me out. I want to say around 50 to 60 games. That's a lot. And then when I was in Charlotte, I broke my foot one year and missed uh, an entire season. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand exactly what Zion's going through. When you're in the recovery process or the rehab process, it's lonely. You feel isolated at times. Even though you're around your teammates, you're still not with them. You're not out there practicing. You're not going through the drills with them. You're, when practice starts, you go off on the side and you got to do your own thing and you're not getting a chance to play basketball. You're doing stability exercises and all types of rehab with all types of bands and all that type of work. And it can be a very lonely process when you're rehabbing, especially if there's not another injured player there with you. <laughs> it can be very lonely. They got you running in the pool and doing all these type of things. And it's a different type of workout for an athlete because most NBA players, we just love the hoop. That's all we, we want right. to go out there and who we want to play basketball, we want to work on our craft, 
And part of the thing that really sucks about being hurt is you can't work on your game as much as you want to, and you can't play ball. I'm sure this kid is missing the game of basketball, and he can't wait to get out there and put on an excellent performance for us tomorrow. And it is, after all, a team sport. It's not like you're tennis players right. or track runners. You're used to being with your teammates. <clears throat> okay, you heard him talk about changing some things, maybe his running style, his gait, um, since he's been out. Have you ever heard of anything like that happening before? Yeah, I actually have heard that with two guys that were bigger bodies also. Miles Turner, when he was coming out of Texas, they were talking about his running style and maybe he needed to change it. There were mm -hmm. some concerns about how he would make it in the NBA because they thought he had a weird gait. Turned out and, pretty good. Yeah, and also, uh, Roy, and also Roy Hibbert. When Roy Hibbert was coming out, when Roy Hibbert was coming out of Georgetown, um, actually before he came out, they were definitely making sure that they wanted to change how he ran. When he first got to Georgetown, they made sure they changed a lot. I, being from the, uh, that area where I played in D.C., Roy being from the DMV, I played against him when he was in high, when he was coming out of high school playing in summer leagues and mm -hmm. stuff. So they definitely did a lot to change the way he got up and down the court. All right, so now uh, Zion Williamson, we're expecting him to return tomorrow. What are your expectations for him? I think he's going to have a very good game. I think that, of course, he's not going to come out there and play 30 minutes. I think he's going to have some highlight dunks. That's just what he does. You've seen all the YouTube clips. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think he's going to have a lot of pressure on him because this isn't like he's coming out there for uh, a team that doesn't have anything. You have Brandon right. Ingram, who might be the most improved player in the league this year. You have Drew Holiday, one of the most underrated players in the league. And you have a veteran like J.J. Redick that provides floor spacing. So there's a lot of good options out there. Zion's not going to have to do everything on his own. I think he's going to come out there and have a big time effect on this game, have some highlight plays off the jump. Cannot wait. And of course, they're well coached by Alvin Gentry. So stay tuned for tomorrow night's action. You don't want to miss that. Now from one big to another, Shaquille O'Neal. Oh, yeah. That's a big body. Blue tips. He's got a lot of things going on here in the studios. One of them is story time with Shaq. So stay tuned. It's coming up next.